Have you ever been brainwashed? And how sure are you that you'd know even if you had? I grew up asking myself these questions and many more. As the youngest child of an ex-Jehovah's Witness family, I was vigilant to the dangers of losing autonomy over my own thoughts. But as an adult, after a history of falling into abuse, addiction, and finally coming face to face with the dark side of recovery, I have to recognise perhaps no one is immune to indoctrination. What defines us is what we will do to break free and who we will become in the next chapter. Welcome to Not In Vain, the podcast about addiction, mental health and recovery in all its forms. My name is Honor Script, a recovered ex-addict and drag weirdo. My opinions are my own, and don't forget, listening to podcasts isn't treatment. If you're concerned about your substance use, then please seek professional advice. Some people may also benefit from mutual aid groups. On this episode, I'm joined by Susan Thorne, a former Jehovah's Witness, and the author of Held by the Watchtower, Set Free by Christ. Of course, I don't usually introduce her so formally. I just call her ma'am. So thanks, ma'am, or Susan Thorne, if you prefer, and uh, welcome to Not In Vain. (laughs) And I love being called ma'am. It's a fairly new experience for me. Um, But now you live in the Northeast. It's great. Thank you. Oh, brilliant. Um, so I've been rereading your book. Obviously, I, I was a child when you wrote it, and I remember reading it when it first came out, but, but that was a very long time ago. Um, and in preparation for this, I've reread it again, and it's, it's incredible. Um, the amount of things that I could identify with it, you know, not with being an ex-Jehovah's Witness, but just other areas of my life, um, mm. and just how completely honest it was, you know, at least as far as I can tell, you know, really didn't hold back from showing what a difficult time it was in your life. Um, have you reread it since you since it came out? Oh yes, I have. Yes, and and it is as far as I know absolutely accurate. I didn't spare myself. Those years in that cult turned me into a hag, and I, I didn't hide that fact in in writing the book. I, I I let it all hang out because it it destroyed me as a person. I, 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 I truly hated myself, but I couldn't help what I was doing. I became so judgmental, so hateful. Um, so how long were you a Jehovah's Witness for? I can't remember the exact timeline. It, it was a, an involvement over 15 years, roughly. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't become a Jehovah's Witness as soon as I got contacted by them. I was very argumentative and I didn't give in easily. I'd say they wore me down over three or four years before I finally got baptised as a witness. And then we had a bit of a, so I'd say a year detaching ourselves before I finally made the break. But altogether it was 15 years, which is a long time, 25 to 40, that, that was the, my age. Yeah. Could have been the best yeah. years of my life when I could have furthered my career perhaps further my education, done a lot of things. And instead I spent my time studying with them, going to a whole lot of meetings three times a week and going out knocking on doors almost every hour that was available. Hmm. I think it feels like a real theft, doesn't it? When you wake up to the fact that you've been involved in something that wasn't true to who you were meant to be and yeah. when you start doing that mental arithmetic of the hours that you've put in the emotional energy um mm. the sacrifices that you've made for something that you no longer believe in it can be very difficult to recognize how much has gone yes yes certainly and you mentioned obviously they kind of wore you down over a period of time and something i found interesting in the book was that you You'd have had a kind of negative perception of Jehovah's Witnesses before you met them, but that once you started interacting with them, you tended to find them sort of very likable, easy to get on with. Um, yeah. And that was an interesting, there was a sort of reflection later in the book where I believe you were in hospital when you were giving birth to me and some Jehovah's mm. Witnesses arrived to see another woman who was in the hospital. Yeah. And you yes. referred to it as them being in the phase of ingratiating themselves. Yes. Um, yeah. Do you that was very like- familiar. I remembered that for myself. Yeah. yeah. They called me when I was vulnerable. 
um, we had lived in a university city. There'd been plenty going on. We'd got friends. Um, I liked the house I lived in. And then my husband finished his PhD. We moved to a small market town. Um, there wasn't anyone there that I particularly related to. Didn't like the house, didn't like the countryside, didn't like the town much. And we were very cut off. My husband was going off early and coming back late, enjoying his career, doing extremely well. And I was in this house with my first child, my toddler, whom I loved very much, but a toddler isn't great company. And I, I fell prey to a knock on the door and two women wanted to talk. Now, I, I argued, I, I, I'm good at arguing, but they wore me down. Um, I eventually invited me because it was cold standing at the door and they were very nice to my little girl. And when I became pregnant with my second child, and of course they were very supportive of me as a pregnant woman. And when I had the baby in, they came with presents and attention and it, it went on from there. But it was difficult to extricate myself. And they began to convince me this was the only way. And I actually became afraid of giving it up. The literature contains some pretty ghastly pictures of the end of the world. People falling down great holes that suddenly appeared in the ground. Great, horrible waves coming in and washing people away. And I, I felt protective. I felt I owed it to my children not to let us get to that point. So much against my real emotions, I got drawn in and, and stopped arguing. Yeah, I was really interested, particularly around the sort of ingratiating behaviour. Are you familiar with the term love bombing? Yes. So this yeah. is something I hadn't heard it then, but that's yeah, that was it. It was yeah. yeah. Yeah, so love bombing, you know, for anyone who hasn't heard of it is, um, I believe the term originated in describing domestic abuse relationships, but it is now used to describe how cults function, how uh, kind of scams function, like uh, multi-level marketing as well. If you find people when they're at a vulnerable place, like you were when, when you'd moved area and you're quite lonely, um, and you meet all of the needs that they feel that they're missing in a very intense, quite codependent, quite overwhelming way, you can cause a psychological dependence to form pretty much instantly. It's it's very, very easy to manipulate people in that way. Um, do you think that the people who are doing that in the Jehovah's Witnesses, do you feel that it was sort of intentional manipulation or more just something that, that they did without questioning? It's difficult to say. Um, a lot of them were really nice people. The, the, the two women who contacted me were really nice people. I, I really related to them. They were very kind. At the same time, I, I know now that, um, well, I, I realised once I became a Jehovah's Witness, that everything they do in the course of door-to-door -door work and follow-up, they report, they have a little, a little, um, sort of chart they fill in each month with how many hours they've spent, how many times they've returned to the same person, that's called a return visit, how many Bible studies they've made, how many pieces of literature they've placed. So they're always aware that is their overriding concern when they start their working day. And so they're very aware of that. So spending time coming into someone's house and spending time with someone who's just had a baby or someone who's not very well or someone who just wants to talk is all useful time and it means that they're sitting down indoors rather than pounding the streets knocking on doors and so although it comes over as love and care and attention it's really time counting oh it's all going to go on the report so it's it's not as good as it looks. It's not as principled as it appears. Yeah, I think it just shows how there can be those multiple levels of motivation going on. Where, as you say, a lot of them are are genuinely, you know, kind, nice people, just like the majority of people yeah. in general are. But if you've always got that thought in the back of your head, I've got to make up these hours. I've got to fill out this card. 
even good motivations can become twisted over time. And it means, you see, that um, when you're studying with the Jehovah's Witnesses and they're bringing you into the organisation, they will spend hours with you. It, because it all goes on the report card. Once you're baptised and you are yourself a Jehovah's Witness, they drop you like a dirty glove because they can't count the hours. So, however much you might be in need of some spiritual comfort and visit a bit of help that isn't helpful for them because it won't go on the report card so you suddenly find you, you're left stranded i was pretty miserable once i was baptized um because my husband who'd been coming along with me suddenly withdrew i went forward for baptism by myself and i felt desperately lonely having let myself in for this religion which I didn't like. I didn't like the meetings or crowds of people all yakking and I didn't like the literature. I didn't like what I was learning really and, and I, was, I was really miserable that first month. Um, I kept getting headaches. In fact by the end of the month I'd, I'd used a whole bottle of aspirin. In those days you could buy a hundred aspirins in a bottle. You can't, you're not allowed to do that now. I bought a bottle of aspirins and by the end of the first month as a Jehovah's Witness I'd used them all. But no one was prepared to help me because they couldn't count the time. And I guess that's where I know you mentioned as well about um, you became really quite desperate for their approval after a time and again yeah, that's part oh, yeah. of how the kind of push and pull of love bombing works where they flooded you with all this attention and affection early on and then withdrew it. And then it put that burden onto you to try to win it back and to try to chase it. Yeah. Um, yes. All of it was just pinging off in my head because I have a history of a, a previous abusive relationship where I started to become aware of those patterns in, in my ex-partner. Um, I've had uh, the relationship that I had with drugs, I would see very much as an abusive relationship, even though it's with an inanimate substance. There was again mm. that that reward and punishment of the the highs mm. and the withdrawals. And mm. then with my experience with Narcotics Anonymous, I experienced very much the same thing when I was a vulnerable newcomer who they mm. could prop up their own egos by saving. I was, mm. they even say it at every meeting, the newcomer is the most important person in the room. That goes fast. Mm. Once you pick up about 90 days, six months, that, that goes. Right. And then if you're not doing right. service, you're not that interesting. How mm. early in that process did you notice it starting to have an impact on you know, family, friends, your relationship, things like that? Um, fairly soon, um, Jehovah's Witnesses make themselves quite different from normal people. They don't celebrate birthdays or Christmas for a start. That immediately causes problems. If you've got any friends who want to invite you out for a drink to celebrate Christmas or send you a Christmas card, you feel you can't reciprocate. And so things got difficult in that way quite quickly. Um, but the longer our involvement was with the Jehovah's Witnesses, the more awkward that became. And eventually some of our um, more distant family members got quite offended because we wouldn't reciprocate. Um, I don't remember very much else initially, not until after I was baptised. But certainly I, I was aware that if I was getting more and more associated with Jehovah's Witnesses, I was going to stand out as quite different. Mm -hmm. um, I think when I started going to meetings, that was when things started to hit. Um, they have three meetings a week, um, Tuesday, Thursday and Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. So the first meeting I went to was Tuesday evening. That was a uh, only an hour. The others were two hours each. Um, and that was just a study of a Jehovah's Witness book. And we read the paragraph and answered the question. It's brainwashing. There's a little question at the end of each paragraph to get you to give the answer that they want you to give from the paragraph. It, it prevents you from asking any of the questions you might have asked. And the procedure at this 
book study, it was held in someone's home, was um, one of the baptised men had to read the paragraphs. Women weren't allowed to read them. <clears throat> and unfortunately, the, the group I went to, neither of the men present could read fluently. It was hilarious, actually. They, there were so many things they couldn't pronounce, like coup d'etat. Um, and I came back in physical pain from trying not to laugh. Um, it, it was really awful. And it just seemed so silly that the women, several of whom could have read fluently, weren't allowed to because women had to be quiet. It was really interesting reading about the dynamics between men and women, because as you mentioned a couple of times in the book, it's quite a female heavy faith, isn't it? You know, probably the majority yeah. of their members are women. Yeah. So the women mm. have kind of strength in numbers and maybe quite a lot of um, sort of power and covert manipulation, but aren't allowed to yeah. show it. Did you yeah. find that your kind of understanding of gender roles or your views of your own sort of role as a woman was affected by it at all? Not greatly, because... Um, and this was 40 odd, more than that, 45, 50, getting on for 50 years ago. Things were a bit different then. I, I was perfectly happy to have um, a less active role than the average man. Um, I'd been, I was married in um, 1971 and I promised to obey my husband in my marriage vows. You know, I didn't question it. Um, actually, he's never told me to do anything, so I've never actually done it. But, um, you know, I said that. So the idea of men taking the lead didn't seem totally foreign to me. It seemed fairly natural. However, I did think that women who were clearly more articulate, and more intelligent, shouldn't be kept out of it completely if the men present were were not that well equipped um, in being able to speak fluently, for example, and to read well. And some women made such a meal of their subservience, um, they became virtually useless, really. There's a, a verse in the Bible that says that women are, are the weaker vessel. But some of them were about as much use as a cracked cup. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, you know, they couldn't do anything for themselves. If there was one woman, had, um, there was a gas leak in her house. So instead of ringing the gas board, she rang her husband. I didn't mind being in subjection to my husband, but I still expected to have a, a role which I could fulfill myself without forever having to ask him. Oh, can we buy some more coffee? Oh, can I ring the gas board? Oh, help me with the, the you know there's a problem at school but can you come and talk to the teacher you know I wanted to take those roles myself and I, and I did but there were lots of women in the congregation who were completely useless they 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 couldn't do anything of their own initiative and and, and that struck me as really silly yeah I guess it ties into you know you talked about um people were kind of in competition with each other for how well they could follow the rules and follow their perception of what the yeah. Bible said. And I yeah. suppose it ties into that, that kind of learned help, helplessness as a way of proving mm. that they took it really seriously, that they were supposed yes. to be the weaker vessel. Yes. Um, but it doesn't sound like a, a healthy way to be, because as you say, even within sort of cultural views that place men and women in very different roles, there is still a clear role for women and things that women are expected yes. that they can excel at. And it seems yes. like the women were even afraid to to have that much authority? Yes, they were. I mean, it seems to run even against what it said in the Bible because women, many of the women in the Bible are very, very competent women. It was their way of interpreting and controlling. There was a lot of control yeah. about all sorts of things. I and mean, there was one awful episode once there was a, an old uh, lady in the congregation, we called them sisters this elderly sister who hadn't got much money and was fairly shabbily dressed. And apparently she went out doing the door to door work and someone she called on happened to comment to one of the elders that he'd had this rather scruffy Jehovah's Witness at his door. The elder didn't know who it was. Well, we had a talk at the meeting 
about whoever this scruffy woman was. It obviously couldn't name her. But she revealed herself by breaking down in, in tears. And now that's not the way to deal with things. The poor woman probably couldn't afford to, to dress any better. She was, she lived alone. She, um, she was a widow. And you know, it was extremely hateful to, to behave in that way. So once you kind of got through those kind of initial years and you'd been baptised and had settled in, what would kind of a typical week in, in your life look like? I know you mentioned three meetings a week. What else kind of <coughs> happened? Right. Well, I aimed to do as much door-to-door -door work as I could. And once I'd settled in to the congregation for a few years, I decided um, I would become what was called an auxiliary pioneer. That meant I would spend about 60 hours a month doing door-to-door -door work. So I usually used to give myself Monday free, but then most weekday mornings I would go out doing door-to-door -door -door work and uh, once my husband had joined us as a witness because he having held back he, he did eventually join me we'd all go out on Saturday morning um, then we we'd go to the book study on Tuesday evening that was at 7 30 that wasn't too bad and that was only for an hour the worst meeting was the Thursday evening. That was at seven o'clock and that was for two hours. That was a rush. Getting my husband um, back from work, the children back from school, fed and changed and all properly tidy because you couldn't go, you couldn't go looking scruffy. And the, the girls had homework to do. Um, it was a real rush. We had to leave the house at 6.30. So it didn't give us a lot of time. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, when, by the time we got back, it was fairly late. Sunday morning was also a bit of a rush. That was, we had to be there for 9.30. That was another two hours. Um, it dominated our lives. We, and we were supposed to have a family Bible study during the week. It wasn't a Bible study. It was actually a study of the Watchtower magazine, ready for the Sunday meeting. And um, the other thing we were expected to do, everyone was supposed to answer a question at the meeting um, from whatever we were studying. And that included the children. So I'd make sure my children got something to say. And you know, I'd say, well, you can answer that question and make sure they knew what they were saying. Um, so it was, it was a big performance. It was nothing like going to church and worshipping. It was a performance. And then... Twice a year, there was what was called a, um, a circuit assembly that was held in a, a big assembly hall. And once a year, there was the horror of horrors, which was the district assembly that was held in a, a sports stadium. Ours was at Twickenham Rugby Ground. That was a four day thing. It was awful sitting in a rugby ground all day. I mean, rugby grounds aren't designed for sitting in all day. They're designed for sitting in to watch a rugby match. All day, sitting there, <laughs> listening to these talks. You couldn't even see who was speaking because he was a little tiny figure right at one end of the great big playing field. It all came over loudspeakers. Your children had to be all neat and tight, no trainers, proper clothes, showing respect. <laughs> Um, it, it was it was terrible and pretending it was all fascinating. These talks, one after another, talk, 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 nothing to relieve it. It, it was just awful. Um, I, I, I admit I hated it, but I believed we, that's what it got to be. Yeah. And that sounds really hard. You know, was there any point where you enjoyed kind of any of the meetings or any of the sort of book study groups or anything like that? Was any of it sort of fun even in the early days or was it always pretty much you do this because you have to? Yeah the, there wasn't really any fun the only satisfaction you could get out of it I wouldn't call it fun but <laughs> satisfaction was in having a clever answer yeah so you think oh I, I know I'm going to say for that paragraph and up would go your hand and they bring you the microphone and you, uh, <laughs> I, I got satisfaction from that 
Yeah. Because I thought, you know, um, reading the book and talking to you now, when you talk about, you know, having the clever answers and, and finding those ways to kind of um, connect the Bible verses to, to make your mm. point. And obviously a lot of what you did on the door-to-door -door work when you did get people yeah. engaged in an argument was finding mm. biblical quotations to prove them wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it seems like you've got a very similar mind to me where you like a little bit of a challenge. You like not, not like a nasty oh, yeah. confrontation, but a little mm. bit of a kind of battle of wits. And it yeah. seems like maybe that's one of the ways they kind of got you hooked in, you know, because from what I've seen, a lot of people have this perception that stupid people get sucked into cults or get sucked into kind of manipulative or abusive organizations mm. or relationships, mm. you know, it's seen as you are stupid and therefore you are weak and that's how you end up in that position. Yeah. But from what I've observed, it's not usually, I mean, I don't really think of anyone as stupid, but it tends to be kind of book smart people who get hooked by it the most easily because we have the complacency of thinking we can think our way out of anything. Yeah, uh, so we get blindsided and we love mm. getting drawn into a debate. And once they've got you talking, they've got you. That's, that's yeah. where it starts. They have. Yes. I mean, there are some very gullible people who get sucked in, um, who simply parrot everything they're told. But yes, it, it appealed to me and, and others like me, something to argue about. I did like doing the door-to-door -door work. I was good at it. I was good at it straight away. I didn't have to learn it. I just jumped straight in and did it. Um, some people are very nervous about doing that. I wasn't. So I enjoyed that. But I did not enjoy the meetings. Um, I didn't like a lot of the Jehovah's Witnesses, although I did have some very, very good friends in the Witnesses. Uh, I didn't like the literature. Um, I've, I thought it was badly written. I thought it was badly presented. Some of the pictures were awful. And I, well, I quite often disagreed with it. Um, but all the same, I believed I'd got to stick with it. And we had this saying, the light will get brighter. So even if it wasn't right now, we thought, oh, it'll, it'll come right later as, as more light is shone upon our understanding. Yeah, I, I try to stop just short of outright drawing a parallel between the Jehovah's Witnesses and Narcotics Anonymous. Because a lot of what you talk about in your book and the things I've heard and, and read from other sources show that there is a, a level of spiritual abuse happening in the Jehovah's Witnesses, which is yeah. unparalleled in any other mainstream organization. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the, the things that you talk about, about those discomforts with the official dogma and feeling you just had to stick with it and hope it would get better and knowing that might mm. take decades was a struggle mm. that I dealt with for the from day one, from day one, you know, the first NA meeting that I went to, there was a reading that said, this is a fellowship of men and women. And straight away, I knew I wasn't welcome. Um, oh. In one of the first readings that I heard, you know, it, it talked about how terrible it is when addiction makes people prostitute themselves. And as a former sex worker, I knew that was not a politically correct way to be speaking about us. Um, yeah. I, I read something, you know, three or four weeks in that talked about how sometimes it can be a good thing when someone dies of an overdose because it can inspire someone else to recover. And I was absolutely horrified, mm. but I thought I would die if I didn't keep going. So I yeah. squashed those feelings down. <laughs> and mm. hearing you talk there, it's, it's that thing of just sort of desperately holding on to the idea that maybe eventually some positive change will trickle through and that allows you yeah. to ignore everything that is really quite bad right now. Yeah, yes, and, and that, that's certainly the case with me. Um, sort of, as time went on, I found my thinking was switching round. It, it, I was brainwashed. I can't see exactly how it was done, but I was brainwashed. Uh, of course, conforming to Jehovah's Witness ways and beliefs is seen as maturity. Yeah. So I thought, oh, I'm, I'm maturing now as a Jehovah's Witness. But actually, I'd been brainwashed. And, yeah, now I'm out of it. I, I can't believe that my mind was switched round to such a degree. But it was. Yeah. And, and I think those, um, those book studies you mentioned with the almost kind of call and response and the repetitive questioning and stuff. Yeah. And even if you're sitting there writing or saying the answers... 
thinking this is a load of bullshit in your head. Mm. Repeating does a hell of a lot to reinforce stuff into your circuits. You know, like our brains are so reprogrammable yeah. and so quickly yeah. we don't even realize that, that it's happening. And a lot of the time it's really harmless stuff. Like if I walk the same route to work every day, within a few days I could do it while well, I've got headphones in, listening to a podcast, not paying attention. Mm. I just go onto autopilot mm. and I get to work, right? And it's yeah. a nice yeah. little um, feature that my brain has to make life easier for me. Mm. The problem is that those kind of studies, you know, the, the kind of literature studies and the question and answer stuff, mm. kind of that circuit and gets your brain doing yeah. that for things that you maybe wouldn't mm. want to be doing. Yeah. 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 Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the service because I find it really interesting. And again, it's something that I related to a lot. So you said you were doing about 60 hours a month, so about 15 hours a week on the the door-to-door -door yes. service. The motivation was simply that the more we did, the more we'd ingratiate ourselves with the organisation. Keep in the centre. They often used to use the um, illustration of a, a fire with you know all the coals in the middle all glowing and the odd one that had fallen out and had turned black and the idea of you know stay in the middle where it's where you'll glow where it's nice and warm and the fact is if you stay in the middle you get burnt to a cinder but uh, <laughs> they didn't carry it quite that far um so the idea was you know to keep yourself in the center of the organization if, if you're just an ordinary member of the congregation you know, keep active in that congregation um, for men, of course, there was the added incentive to progress through the hierarchy um, to become a ministerial servant and an elder. And that was the um, what men were generally aiming to be elders. And did you find, you know, it's, with it being such a huge time and energy commitment, did you find that had any kind of negative impact on your well-being? Because I've experienced that with, and this, to be fair, is not something I can entirely pin on, mm. on NA, um, is that I threw myself into NA service to a degree that was really, really damaging for me. Um, and only some of that was due to external pressure. A lot of that was due to my own kind of perfectionism and issues I hadn't worked through. Mm. Um, but there was a point where I had 12 different service positions across various meetings and service bodies, mm. um, probably a similar time commitment to what you were doing. And I yeah. started to just lose my mind. Like I just wasn't getting sleep. I wasn't eating properly. I was reliant on caffeine and stuff. You know, did did you feel there was any kind of effect like that? It, it did have a bad effect on my health. Um, I've always generally been very healthy. No, I still am. But during my 15 years involvement with the Jehovah's Witnesses, especially once we started going to all those meetings, the stress of that really got at me um it it affected my my digestive system basically i think i probably had an ulcer i never had it diagnosed but i used to get a most dreadful sharp stomach pain um i often couldn't eat or i hadn't got time to eat so, I mean, thursday evening in particular I hadn't got time to eat or i bolted my dinner so fast it, it went down like a brick and I remember some times during the meeting, I was in so much pain. Um, it was just awful. Um, at one point, I got so stressed up, I had difficulty swallowing. I, I did have to go to have an examination and I had a gastroscopy to make sure there was nothing wrong. There wasn't, there wasn't anything wrong. It was just stress. I found it interesting as well. Uh, a few minutes ago, we were talking about something around the door-to-door -door work and you said you were kind of naturally gifted at it and you took to it straight away. But I noticed when you, around the end of the book, when you were talking about after you'd left, you know, you kind of wanted to reach out to people and make amends and anyone mm. who kind of converted to the witnesses kind of rescue them. And your success mm. rate at that point was zero. You you hadn't actually converted anyone. Is that the case? No, you hadn't. So if that's exceptionally good, I'm taking that to mean the majority of other Jehovah's Witnesses would were also kind of averaging 0% success rates on the door-to-door -door work? Yes, the, the growth rate was about 1% a year on average. Yeah. Um, so some people were making converts. Uh, I'm really thankful I, I didn't. I'd have felt terrible if I'd brought anyone into it and left them there. Um, 
but yes, the, the growth rate was steady. I, I don't know what it is now. I haven't kept up with the statistics, but on average, it was growing by 1% a year at, at that, that time that we were involved. Which is so significant, the, you know, but it's not, it's not enormous considering that it sounds like the majority of witnesses are going out making attempts to make converts multiple hours a week. Oh, yes. Well, you weren't counted as a Jehovah's Witness. Um, unless you were doing at least four hours a month. So it's interesting, a little while ago I read something and I tried to find it to prepare properly for this. I tried to see if it was in my bookmarks and I couldn't, but it was a really interesting little analysis on why so many organisations and cults and, and, and including some mainstream religions as well, um, particularly in, in maybe sort of pockets of those religions that aren't particularly spiritually well, they have such a strong and obsessive focus on going out and trying to convert people and particularly things like cold, call, cold calling and door mm. knocking um, yeah. because they know it's got a low success rate. Um, same with people who stand in the middle of town centres screaming through a megaphone. They yeah. don't expect to convert anyone. The reason that that tends to be done is because of the psychological impact on the people doing it. So if yes, you're out in the cold and you're knocking on doors and you've got people opening the door and going, oh, fuck me, it's Jehovah's Witness. Get out, get off me step. Yeah, yeah. That is reinforcing the us versus them. So you are safe in the kingdom hall. You're safe with the other witnesses. And like you say, they're showering mm. you with gifts and attention and love and support in the early yeah. days. And then mm. you go from in there to out there where you're met with yeah. hostility and you maybe encounter people who are dressed scruffily or only partially clothed, people smoking, people mm. drinking, people taking drugs. Mm. And it's all these things that don't happen in your congregation. And again, that oh, yes. is being reinforced. The, yes, um, the directive to convert is a lot more to keep people in than it is to bring people in, I believe. It, it yes. certainly makes sense. Yes, that, that's, that's very true. Um, and we used to see it very particularly when we had our ghastly big um, assemblies at sports grounds. Because um, I mean, during the 1980s, when I was most active as a witness, there was a lot in the news about football hooligans and you know, riots after football matches and things like that. That, that was you know, associated with big sports stadiums. And of course, the contrast when Jehovah's Witnesses were there was amazing because um, we were very proud. You know, we, there wouldn't be a riot. There wasn't any litter. Everyone was very orderly. And, and we, you know, we just felt such a degree of pride that we could have a four day convention and leave con no mess at all. Whereas one football match or one rugby match would leave it littered with rubbish and probably a few brawls going on. And yeah, we used to refer to outside as the world and we were in the truth. Yeah. So, you know, it, it was, it Ours was, was uh, in, in the rooms and in the madness. <laughs> oh, really? Yes. <laughs> mm. oh, it's the same principle, isn't it? Yeah. In and out. Yeah. 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 That that psychological that. divide, as soon as that is there in your head, you become that fearful yeah. of the outside world and start seeing everything as a threat. And it's so much harder yeah. to leave. Um, Oh, yeah. The Jehovah's Witnesses as well, they discourage uh, what they call worldly friendships, don't they? You know, any kind of strong connections with yes. people outside the faith. Yes, they do. I mean, it's difficult to have worldly friendships because you're so different. And you mentioned, obviously, about um, disfellowshipping, and that kind of goes hand in hand with the practice of shunning. Um, I know we haven't got quite to your exit yet, but do you want to explain a little bit about what shunning is when people either leave or are disfellowshipped? Yes. Um, if someone was disfellowshipped or left Jehovah's organization, no one was allowed to speak to them at all. If it was someone within your family, someone who was actually living in your home, like a, a child, a grown-up child who decided they were leaving the witnesses or had committed some offence, you, you were allowed to speak to them, but you still had to keep it to a minimum. But if it was someone outside your home, even if it was a family member, you had to um, shun them as far as possible. That meant you, you wouldn't, wouldn't smile at them in the street, wouldn't speak to them. 
if they decided to return, they couldn't just turn up. They had to contact an elder first and say, I want to come back. And they were then allowed into the kingdom hall. They had to sit at the back and they weren't allowed to speak to anyone. No one was to speak to them until they had been fully reinstated. When we left, um, when, when we had written and told them we were leaving, it was, it was just like a shutter coming down. The next time I saw any one of them in the street, the, I just had this you know, blank look. And um, I can remember on one occasion, I was going into a coffee shop and there was a woman coming out and I got you in your pushchair. <laughs> And this woman held the door open for me. And as I was going through, something fell off the shopping tray and I was picking it up and um, I put it back. And the woman turned out to be someone from the Kingdom Hall. And when she saw it was me, instead of standing normally and, and smiling at this poor woman with a baby in a pushchair and a shopping falling off, she just stood straight up and looked up into the air like this uh, until I'd gone past. <laughs> through the door um, and on another occasion I, I'd, I'd taken you into the park and we bought a drink and we went and sat at a table and there was a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses at the next table and when they saw us they just got their drinks and, and went. They couldn't even stay within arm's reach of us in case I started to contaminate them. So it was, it was very complete. Yeah. The, the worst thing was that um, there was one family who were very, very close friends. Now, they weren't in our congregation. They were in another one, but they used to come and stay in the school holidays. They had three children. Um, they used to come and play with my two. They'd stay over for a few days. We used to go out together and we really loved each other, really. And that was the worst thing. Um, I put off telling them that we'd left. We put it off for quite a while until the school holidays were approaching and I'd, I'd got to tell them. Um, it was one of the most harrowing things. Um, I spoke to the mother of the family. She cried when I told her, I cried. Uh, that was it, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't see each other anymore. And, and that was, it was, that was a big wrench. It upset my daughters, of course. Um, but we, we knew it was the right thing to do. We, you know, we, we couldn't continue the friendship if they wouldn't speak to us. Well, obviously, we, we would have been delighted to see them. But since they weren't going to be allowed to speak, we, we couldn't. So, no, not really. It's a shame. And it's, it's such a harsh rule to have. Um, and even though it's not a rule that the NA has, it's something I've unfortunately experienced. I've lost probably a hundred friends in the last year, um, oh. which has been brutal. And I was kind of reflecting when I was reading it today, you know, it touched a nerve. Um, and I, I was reflecting, you know, when I left, the three responses I had from people were that uh, they would miss me and would see me when I came back. <laughs> like yes. very clear you know you will be back and we will not speak until you do but said in a nice uh, friendly way um or just completely cut off as if i was dead uh or yeah. people being very very positive and upbeat sounding about it but framing it very much as my existence is now a threat to their life and so they have to keep themselves safe from how dangerous yeah. i am <laughs> Um, yeah, well, right. that's basically how I, I was viewed. I, I was yeah. a threat. Yeah. And of course, when I wrote that book, yeah. that was the limit. I'd written a book about it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's again, it comes back to the us versus them thing. As long as soon as someone takes even half a step over that line towards being them, they become a, a hostile sort of force, um, whether they have any desire to be or not. I mean, I guess with you having written a book, maybe you sort of uh, participated in that role slightly, but but it wouldn't have mattered whether you had or not. You know, it sounded like their, their minds were already made up. Oh, yes. Yes, they were. Yeah. Um, so we've talked a little bit there about what happened sort of when you left. Um, 
and you mentioned earlier the process of building up to leave took you a while um what was for you the kind of the moment where you decided you were definitely going to go and that you were done with it um well it was it was when i realized they were actually misrepresenting the bible um they were also misrepresenting other information um now both mike and i spotted this and caused us both quite a, a lot of trouble mike's a scientist you know he, he well of course you know because he's your dad <laughs> um whenever the jehovah's witnesses were dealing with any scientific findings that didn't match with their particular interpretation of the bible so things like the age of the earth the age of um mankind um creation evolution mike used to spot that they'd misquoted misapplied information and he he could tell they'd done it deliberately because they were quoting from things if they'd read them properly it was quite obvious what they were saying but they lifted bits out to make it say something quite different so mike started to spot things like that <clears throat> i started to spot things where they were quoting anything to do with child psychology because that had been my subject when i was a student and you know, they just handled it wrong and what they the conclusions that they drew were wrong. Well, that was bad enough, but then they claimed everything they believed was based on correct interpretation of the Bible. And I found that they were actually doing exactly the same thing with the Bible. They were lifting out half verses straight out of context and then telling you what it meant when in fact when you put it back in the context it says something completely different mm -hmm. and i got worried about that um the, there were quite a lot of things that they that you know they could reel off a great long argument but it was wrong and in my final year as a jehovah's witness i i was doing door-to-door -door work I called on someone who turned out to be a Baptist minister and he knew Hebrew and Greek he really knew what he was talking about he knew the Bible really well he was a proper theologian and talking to him I, I could see that uh, things had been totally misrepresented it was deliberately wrong they were actually telling lies but I was still terrified of leaving, didn't know where I'd go. I, I, I knew I was a believer. I've always believed in God. But I didn't know where I could go. I knew I was going to lose some really precious friends. And we were so enmeshed with the whole organisation. It, it was really frightening, but I knew I'd got to get out. Um, you were born then. That sort of <laughs> you were a good excuse for not getting too involved with the organisation. I'd had a baby. I wasn't supposed to have another baby. They told us not to have any more babies because Armageddon was coming. We'd had a whole study on not having any more babies. I jolly well wanted another baby, and I, I'm glad I had you. I am. That like, was really interesting though when I was reading the book, but I think you'd said that you'd been going to have another baby in 1987 and then didn't because yeah. of, so if you'd had another baby in 1987, I wouldn't exist. Yeah. So no, you wouldn't. All, we're all right in the end. Yes, no, it's worked out. Um, so that sort of gave me a bit of a breather. Uh, you know, the, the late stages of the pregnancy and, and having you. Um, Finally, you know, well, you've read the book. I had a spiritual experience of suddenly understanding that um, to please God, it didn't have to do all these rules and things. I could just accept that Jesus had died for me. Um, that's what finally catapulted me out. Um, 
and it all well it all came about um, and it happened to be a Sunday morning so I went to church went to a church with the longest drive so we could sneak up in the car <laughs> and sort of whip out and get into the church without being seen because at that point we didn't want to be seen going to church we wanted to leave in an orderly way we didn't want to get disfellowshipped yeah uh, we wanted to take our time and write a letter and do it all you know, it's taking um, back control isn't it that's so essential after a period of feeling like it's been taken away from you you need to set the terms yeah. of, of what happens next yeah mm. um i guess speaking of what happens next it was interesting you know finishing the book today it ends mm. almost with an abrupt happy ever after you know maybe like two or three pages of sort of like and then everything yeah. was great and everything was fine yeah i know yeah. obviously you wrote the book in 1998 so only about eight years after you'd left um yes reflecting on it now do you feel that that was as simple an exit as you felt it was at the time oh no 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 not at all no it's been a bumpy ride it's been worth it but it's been a bumpy ride um unfortunately the church with the long drive was pretty cultish in itself um it felt like perfect heaven when we first went and of course everyone was very kind very <laughs> attentive there I was with a you know a new baby so they all came and cooed over you and they were very very kind and you know they they recognized I'd, I'd escaped from the wicked Jehovah's Witnesses they are absolutely lovely but in fact it was part of a pretty cultish organization called New Frontiers International and it wasn't as bad as the Jehovah's Witnesses but it was pretty controlling um we lasted there for two years and um and left and it yeah you know, it was difficult to find a church where i could settle down we, we have but it was it was difficult yeah and my memories from childhood was there was for a lot of years a lot of kind of unspoken insecurity around church membership i remember we yeah. moved churches quite a lot uh, I yes, remember one time you were trying to to find a church for another family member and ended up having a, a huge breakdown in London because we couldn't find a, we couldn't find it oh, and if yeah. you did find it it wasn't what you'd expected. Oh, no. I remember yeah. not understanding it at that age. I didn't understand why you couldn't just pick one that was good enough and we'd settle. But reading this again as mm. an adult, I get it. Yeah, you know, there was that need for it to not be what you'd come from to not have those really oh, yeah. exciting situations. Yeah, yeah. I'd I, I think unless you've experienced being in a cult, you don't really realise the, the dangers. Um, and no, I was determined I wasn't going to get caught another another time. And we left the witnesses fallen into this New Frontiers church, which um, oh, it made me ill. <laughs> it, it, it did. It made me ill all over again. Um, so I, I was very careful after that and we, we made some bad choices, but we we learned to get out fast. We saw it going the way we didn't like. Yeah. Um, fortunately, there are some normal sane Christians about and I have found some. But the, there's a lot. There is a strong tendency amongst people to find something authoritarian that will make all the decisions for them. Tell them what to do. Tell them what not to do enclose and keep out the wicked world or whatever you call the outside and um yeah I, th I think there's a danger of that and you know we, we to some extent or other we're all a bit susceptible to it I'm, mm -hmm. I'm very on the lookout for that sort of thing now I don't think I'll be caught again I hope not hopefully but I guess it's as you say it's just having that that learning and knowledge of how to get out fast because I don't think anyone's ever completely immune to it because we've all got weak spots we've all got vulnerabilities mm. we've all got those little things that people can get their claws into if they know what they're looking mm. for and the more mm. self-aware we are about those weaknesses the more we can protect ourselves but ultimately it's always kind of having that moment of checking in with yourself and going is this situation i'm in right now where i want to be and how can i get out if not um, yeah which i guess can also lend itself to hyper vigilance which is just as unhealthy as getting hooked into another cult it, it isn't it? yeah yeah <laughs> I wonder if, you know, because I know that you obviously made the move from Jehovah's Witnesses to, I think it's fair to say evangelical Christianity was the kind of main sort of flavour that you fit into for a while. Uh, initially, but I've, I've moved right away from evangelical Christianity now. Yeah. Um, 
And because I think a lot of when you wrote the book, you know, you'd maybe started to to move away a little bit. But um, there was a bit that amused me a little bit when you mentioned that your youngest child would be raised wholly Christian, um, which yes. obviously didn't didn't quite play out. No, it didn't work with it all the right work. intentions from your side. But um, yes. I guess there was still that kind of internal pressure that you had that there was one truth and it must be shared with with everyone, whether they wanted it or not. And yeah. Um, yeah, how would you I, say I, your kind of spirituality has evolved with, with I guess, the journey that I've been on, you know, of you ending up being mm. the, the parent to a sex worker and then the parent to a drug addict and then the parent to a neo-pagan who practices witchcraft, you know, how, how has that kind of forced you to evolve, if it has? Um, it's, I, I've been, over the years, I've been, um, I've been a Christian for 31 years. Um, and over the years, I have become increasingly tolerant of different views. Um, when I left the Jehovah's Witnesses, I'd been so used to one view being correct and everything else being wrong that I was looking, again, for the very correct view, all of um, the rest of which would be wrong. Um, as, as time's gone on, I have relaxed a lot about that. I, I guess I wouldn't have been delighted years ago to think that you were going to relinquish Christianity and become a, a pagan and whatever else. <laughs> but I can see how much good your faith has done you. I'm certainly not prepared to say, oh, that's rubbish, that's evil, there's something wrong with that. Um, and I can, I can see your faith is good for you. It's that you've achieved things with the strength of your beliefs that are far beyond just ordinary human achievement. And so I'm, I'm certainly not prepared to say that's wrong, false or anything else. Um, I'm basically, I'm, I'm perfectly content with my faith. I believe it's the truth. I believe it's right and good but i'm i'm not prepared to have this very narrow exclusive view there are no doubt many christians be absolutely horrified to hear me saying that <laughs> but i've um, i've become used to seeing how things work out the, the bible says women shouldn't preach um but as time went on, I met a, a woman who was an extremely good church minister. And then we, we moved house and went to another church. And we had a female vicar, Pauline. You remember Pauline. She yeah. was brilliant. I had to change my views. And eventually I was called to be a preacher. And I, so I was in a position to, to say, yeah, I can do that. The Bible says women should be quiet. <laughs> but society's changed, things have changed, women have changed, so views are different. And I'm just prepared to see, you know, if something, if something is clearly good, then I'm not prepared to say it's wrong. Um, in a similar way, the Bible sounds very forthright in condemning homosexuality. But there are some homosexual Christians who are clearly equipped and anointed there's someone called John Bell who writes the most wonderful songs he's gay he's clearly he, he's he's filled with the Holy Spirit so he he must be accepted by God he wouldn't be able to do that otherwise and so clearly whatever the Bible means or meant when it said those things about homosexuality being an abomination Whatever it's talking about, it's it's not what we are observing now in people who are of the LGBT community and some of whom are clearly Christians. So, yeah, I've, um, I've switched around in a lot of ways. I hope I haven't been brainwashed like I was when I was a Jehovah's Witness, but it, it all seems to make sense. And no one's told me I've got to believe these things. These are things that have just presented themselves to me, and that's how I feel. That's, I think, the crucial thing with spirituality is it's it is that following your own gut, you know. And you might seek knowledge from other people and experience, but no one decides what you believe for you. You 
you you hear what's out there and you figure it out as you go. Um, mm. And it kind of circles back to the issue you identified all the way through the book with the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, that the, they have religion without spirituality, essentially. They, they yes. don't prioritize a relationship with God. In fact, a lot of them aren't mm. even interested in that as a side effect. It's, mm. it's a transactional relationship with the divine where they do works yeah. for him and he gives them paradise in return. Mm. It's very, very almost clinical feeling, this kind of trade-off. That's how it came across to me. Um, and I've I've been in spaces and groups of people where the focus was very much on what you could do for God or a God or a higher power or whatever you chose to call yeah. it and what you would get in return rather than yeah. about expressing devotion, expressing worship, like developing yeah. that personal relationship. Yeah. And, you know, I've met some really, really happy, fulfilled atheists. I don't think necessarily everyone needs a relationship with a God, but for people who do a half relationship is so much more painful than no relationship at all. Feeling like yes. it's right yeah. there, but you can't quite reach it because there's something, yeah. almost always something inside yourself that's blocking you from actually feeling it is not mm. a good place to be stuck in. And I've had a few moments over the course of my faith developing where I've had one of those barriers and then found a way to smash through it and develop that level of conscious contact that I really craved. Mm. And, and then life yeah. gets in the way and, and barriers come up again and then you find a new way to break through it. And yeah, it sounds like you've had that same journey, you know, where it's always about trying to make sure there is no barrier between you and the God of your understanding. Yes, yes, and that, that's true. That, that's been my experience since I've become a Christian. As a Jehovah's Witness, God receded until he was an infinitesimal speck on the horizon because I was so focused on keeping all these rules, doing all these works. Um, there wasn't much time to think about God. And it's really nice hearing the way that you talk about, about the evolution of your faith as well, because I know for a, a huge chunk of time, it was always a, a point where we would clash heads. You know, I became an atheist when I was, what, about 12, 13 stayed yeah, that way yeah. for a, a long time much of it quite happily you know I just didn't feel the need to seek for anything beyond that um yeah. and then had this um spiritual experience about six seven years ago now I guess it must have been that I started mm. to really develop a faith again um but it was in something about as far away from Christianity as you could get you know I'm I'm a polytheist my patron goddess is is a feminine form of energy um you know, a lot of my kind of religious practices and stuff are very different from Christianity. But I find now when I have conversations like this with people who have maybe a more conventional sort of uh, religious style, is that when we talk about spirituality, rather than talking about our religious practices, yeah. we connect, you know, if I talk yeah. about like how I pray, or what I believe my, my goddess is like, and, and things like that, we start to drift apart. But when we talk mm. about that personal relationship with the divine being guided by your gut, being drawn mm. to develop that relationship further that is what unites us you know i was on the last yeah. episode talking to to mandy lee about this um mm. she's got some spiritual practices that just don't align with mine and that i don't really understand but when we talk about why we do our spiritual practices we are exactly mm. on the same level the why yeah. is the important yeah. bit so much more than the what yes yeah so the book obviously it's been quite a long time since that came out now 1998 so we're what 23 years um and i know it's it's not in print anymore is it i had to get a second hand copy yeah yeah so does that mean it's the copyright to... or the license or whatever it is is returned to you yes yes the copyright's mine now i, I can do things with it um I, i've often thought about doing things with it i haven't not yet uh, i'll have to give that some thought yeah because uh, i think it's a it's a story that still fascinates people um, getting out of a cult is it's always an interesting story Definitely. Uh, whatever the cult is whatever the the situation people are interested in how you escape from that sort of controlling environment um, so I, I may well do something else with the book I'll, I'll have to see yeah because there's so much potential there you know it, it feels very fresh you know considering that the story takes place obviously through the the 80s mainly um, and the mm. book was written more than 20 years ago. It feels very fresh. It feels very current. And although the Jehovah's Witnesses' beliefs will have evolved a little bit over time, a lot yeah, of those really, really harmful practices like like shunning, like the banning of blood transfusions, mm. Um, mm. will be very much the same. 
So it feels like it it could be the time for a, a new edition or maybe even a sequel. It would be interesting to mm. to have a more deep look at, at how yeah. things have evolved for for you and and how you kind of heal, you know, how you recover from a trauma like that. Um, yeah. Because it is a trauma, even if you kind of mostly get away unscathed. I think 15 years of being lied to and of having to be guarded with how you express doubt and having mm. other people messing with your autonomy of your mind, it's, mm. it's a trauma. And it'd be fascinating to dig deeper into kind of how you've learned to heal from that. Yes. Yes, it's hard to say exactly. I, it's taken time. Um, it has. Um, and unfortunately, I've had, you know, some bad experiences in, in Christian churches as well. Um, I'll have to see if I rewrite the book or write a sequel. Um, I, you know, I've, I've often thought about doing it. I've, I even started writing one some years ago and then I wasn't pleased with it, so I left it. Um, I'll, I'll have to see. Wow. Mm. But no, it was it was really lovely to read it again, and it's been amazing getting to to talk to you about it in more detail as well. I think mm. this has given me so much more of an understanding about some of the the ways that you have reacted to certain churches, certain conversations about faith and stuff throughout my life that I just didn't get until I read it as an adult and recontextualized it through some of the experiences I've had of coercive mm. control, manipulation, mm. indoctrination. Um, mm. It was really, really powerful, really emotional to read. And hopefully some more people will, will pick up a copy. I know I've got a few friends who are ex Jehovah's Witnesses and I've suggested it before, but hopefully this will give them a, a little nudge to check it out. Cause yeah. I think wherever you're yeah. at with faith now, it's, it's just a, an amazing story and I'm glad that you managed to tell it. Um, just one last thing I wanted to ask, do you have any advice for, I guess either your past self or anyone who finds themselves in a position where they suspect they might be being indoctrinated into a, a group they don't fully agree with, what would you advise them? I'd say don't go, don't go against your instincts. My instinct with Jehovah's Witnesses, with you know, these first two women who turned up at my door, was that they were gullible not very intelligent, not questioning enough. And I was dead right. They, they just fallen for it, hook, line and sinker, the way I was going to do. <laughs> um, and of course, as time went on, I, I got persuaded that it was what they said was right. But my first instinct was, this isn't right. And that should have stayed with that. It would have saved me a lot of trouble. That sounds like really good advice. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for coming on to talk to me today. And we will leave it there. Is there anything else you want to add before we wrap up? No, I think you've asked a, a lot of very comprehensive questions. And I think I've said all I, I need to say. And it's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much, Felix. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for listening and I hope you'll join me next time here on Not In Vain. On the next episode, it'll just be me digging a little bit deeper into some of the topics that our guests have shared with us recently, looking at recovery capital, spirituality, faith and spiritual abuse. Hope to see you there.